page for upcoming talks. Our February talk on February 25th is planned to be live. And so uh, keep an eye on the MAPS webpage for updates. We are going to try to have it live in the MJC auditorium on East Campus. And we're going to also stream it for people who can't make it live. And uh, if there's any changes that have to be made, then you know that's where you'll find that information. Also, the science colloquium talks, which are in the afternoons, Wednesday afternoons. There's one coming up in two weeks on February 9th, Wednesday, February 9th at 3.15. And that is going to be Andrew Gardner, a professor from CSU Stanislaus. He's going to give the Darwin Day talk on various contrivances by which California and foreign plants are pollinated by insects. Oh, our next uh, MAPS talk coming up in February that we're planning to be live. I forgot to say even the topic of that one. That is going to be um, on the weather versus climate and the impacts on the environment. And Dirk Verdun, a KCRA meteorologist, is going to be there as well as a panel of speakers about the weather versus climate topics. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Emeritus Terry Curtis, who uh, used to teach marine biology at MJC, to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Linda. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Danielle Cantrell to you. I'm especially excited for her talk this evening about the Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge, not only because it is a fascinating and ecologically important place, but also because Danielle Cantrell and her husband, Matt Holcomb, have been family friends for many years. Dr. Cantrell earned a Bachelor of Science degree in biological science with an emphasis in conservation biology from Cal State University, Long Beach. She earned her Master of Science degree in biology with a marine emphasis from UC Riverside. She then went on to complete a doctoral degree in veterinary epidemiology with an emphasis in aquatic epidemiology from the Atlantic Veterinary College at the University of Prince Edward Island, Canada. Throughout her path of higher education, Dr. Cantrell has actively participated in outreach programs for students that promote STEM education and careers. During her doctoral program, she coordinated the University of Prince Edward Island's K through 12 outreach program. Let's talk science, which included training volunteers, developing science activities, and, uh, and expanding the program even more. Danielle presently resides in the San Jose area, and on most Sundays, you will find her and her husband, Matt, surfing off the coast of Santa Cruz. During tonight's talk, Dr. Cantrell will share her experiences as a conservation biologist with the Palmyra Atoll Rainforest Realignment and Reef Resili Resiliency Project leadership team, working to restore the beautiful and ecologically important ecosystems of the Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge of the Equatorial Pacific. Please welcome Dr. Cantrell. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Terry, for that lovely introduction. Um, yeah, Terry is a good friend of ours, and I'm very honored to be here. So as Terry said, my name is Danielle, uh, and I'm going to be speaking with you today about a still ongoing project that I worked on for about two and a half years while I was working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge. Um, this project is to realign the atoll's rainforest ecosystem as part of a larger project that is aiming to make the atoll and the reefs around the atoll as resilient as possible, um, with the idea being that they will be able to withstand changes and stressors in the coming decades, largely due to climate change. 
So I'm going to give you a lot of background about the ecology of the atoll uh, at the start of this talk, both because I'm an ecologist and this is what I am personally interested in, um, but as well because I'd like to contextualize for you why this project is important and why it really matters for more than just uh, Palmyra, this one little island itself, but um, sort of matters on a global scale. So I'm gonna be speaking with you today a lot about invasive species. The bulk of this project has to do with removing invasive plants from Palmyra Atoll and reforesting with native tree species. Uh, so I wanted to really take a moment to explain what an invasive species is since it's so important to the talk today um, and why they're so damaging. Um, so by definition, an invasive species is any species that causes ecological harm, and it is typically in an environment where it is not native. So what do we mean by native? So a species is native to an environment if it has evolved in that community of species. So this concept, you know, it's kind of intuitive. Um, you just if you give an example, it really immediately becomes apparent. So Lions, for example, they are native to Sub-Saharan Africa. They are not native to Arctic climate. So if you're in Greenland and you see a lion, you know there's something wrong. Uh, likewise, uh, polar bears are native to the Arctic, but they are not native to Sub-Saharan Africa. So if you are in Sub-Saharan Africa and you see a polar bear, you would probably be concerned. So generally speaking, when you introduce a new species somewhere, generally they don't do super great. You can imagine a polar bear is not gonna be super happy to be in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but occasionally you have these uh, instances where the species actually do really, really well um, to the point that it actually becomes a problem. So oftentimes this happens because uh, the species can survive in that introduced climate but the natural ecological controls have been removed. So things like predator, predators, um, maybe disease dynamics, competition for some sort of resource, all of those natural things that would keep that population in check have been removed. And as a result, that species can just really, really take over. Um, and this picture uh, is one I took just with my GoPro down on Palmyra, and this is of really um, highlights a, an instance of an invasive species. So in this photo, you can see there are all these little things that look like sea anemones, and they're actually an invasive corallomorph species that was introduced by um, an accidental shipwreck. And you can see it is smothering all of this native uh, reef species. And we've actually lost kilometers of reef to this introduction. And this is sort of what often happens when those invasive species are, are introduced. They just, they just absolutely take over. So invasive species are a problem globally. Even here in our own backyard in California, it is a, an absolutely massive ecological issue. Uh, but islands are particularly sensitive to invasive species. And the reason for that is because these communities, they've often been evolving in extreme isolation for a very long time. So the species become highly specialized and they've often lost natural defenses. So uh, there's generally speaking, there are not, there's very often not predators on islands. So here's an example. Um, this is from Johnston Atoll. Uh, this is another island that our office managed um, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And this is a red-tailed tropic bird. So these birds nest on the ground and somebody on a yacht visiting most likely illegally, um, at least this is, what, this is what we think, we don't know definitively, um, accidentally introduced this ant. It's a yellow crazy ant. And these ants spray formic acid. Now these birds have been nesting and living on, you know, out on these atolls for so long, without ever having encountered an ant, that they had they had no reaction to being exposed to these ants. So in this photo, this bird has been blinded um, by having these ants crawl on them and spray formic acid. Um, there was a lot of other um, like more grisly damage. There's some worse pictures we could show with uh, beak damage and, and uh, you know, dead, very young chicks, but they were decimated by this introduction. And this project though, it does, this, this situation does have a happy ending because after about 10 years and 
um, uh, you know, multi-millions of dollars and tons of volunteer effort. Um, we have, um, Oh, sorry. We uh, and multi millions of dollars worth of effort. We have eradicated yellow crazy ants from Johnston Atoll. So it can be done. Um, but I do want to reiterate that once they are established, it takes absolutely Herculean efforts. And uh, it's really better to just prevent these things from ever happening than to try to fix the situation once it's occurred. So you know, that's just some background to really start talking about this project. So um, we're what I'm going to really be harping on today is the coconut control project on Palmyra Atoll National Wildlife Refuge. Um, this is a still ongoing project and it was based out of uh, our Honolulu office for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that office manages both Papahana Makuakea as well as the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. So just to sort of help you place where these are located. So uh, this is a map of a, a, lot, a large part of the Pacific. Um, these are the main Hawaiian islands here. So Oahu, uh, Maui, all those ones you, you know of that maybe you've taken vacations to or know people who have, that's right here where these islands are. Um, what a lot of people on the mainland don't really know though is that there are a lot of islands that continue to the um, up to the northwest of the main Hawaiian islands. And they're uninhabited, but they have a, um, they have a lot of really important wildlife. And this area is called Papahana Makuakea. It's a protected marine national monument. And then the one that Palmyra is a part of, the second marine national monument managed out of our office, are all of these green polygons. And so Palmyra is actually right here. It's about a thousand miles southwest of Hawaii. And it's about five degrees north of the equator here. So you can see it's really um, quite close to the equator. Um, because if it's nearly equatorial location, Palmyra gets about 14 feet of rain a year. So it is very much this beautiful green, um, you know, lush island, which is quite different than the other islands that are managed in our, in our office. Those are typically a lot more dry. Um, it takes between five and seven days to get to Palmyra if you are going by boat. But generally speaking, it, nowadays we arrive by small plane. And you can actually see in this photo here, there is a little runway. Um, the runway that we use is a crushed coral rubble runway. It was built during World War II. Um, and it is now currently maintained by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, so they keep it the runway in safe working order for us. Um, so I just, people always, have a lot of questions about the runway. So uh, I, I do, I will show you about like a little 10 second clip of taking off on the runway from the cockpit. So I, you know, it does feel like a bit of an adventure, but I do want to reiterate that um, the Nature Conservancy spends a lot of money maintaining this runway so that it is usable. And we have some really, really talented pilots who get us in and out of the Yeah, that's it. It's just uh, taken off from that runway there. All right, so Palmyra is now a wildlife refuge, um, but it, you know, it didn't get there until the early 2000s and it has a very, very colorful history. Um, and if you actually, if you're interested in more on Palmyra, there's an incredible website called the palmyraarchive.org that has a, like a lot of history about Palmyra on there. Um, so I'll just give you a quick slide about its history. Uh, first, uh, there is no history of permanent civilization on Palmyra. So it in all likelihood was used by Polynesian wayfarers who were journeying between Samoa and Hawaii as like a rest stop because it's about halfway between those two and there, there is evidence that has, you know, was used, but there was no permanent civilization uh, at any point on Palmyra. Uh, in 1862, it was claimed by the Kingdom of Hawaii by King Kamehameha IV. And then in World War II, the US Navy said, 
thank you, we'll be taking that. And they used it to build a hospital location and an R&R &R base for sailors serving in the South Pacific. And during this time, the atoll was extensively modified. So its land mass was doubled and they did that by dredging from the lagoon. Um, they built an underground hospital. They built a series of roads that connected all the islands and the atoll. Um, and there was up to several thousand sailors at any given time uh, on this atoll. Um, it's also, Palmyra has passed through several private owners, and in 2000, the Fullard Leo family sold it to the Nature Conservancy for $30 million. The Nature Conservancy did um, want to make it a nature preserve. However, as a private entity, they are not able to regulate who has access to the waters. And they really wanted, of course, to protect the reefs as well. And so the ultimate plan was that in 2001, they sold it at a major loss to the US Fish and Wildlife Service with the understanding that it would then be turned into a uh, wildlife refuge. And when that happened, then there was protection out to 12 nautical miles. Additionally, and this little tidbit is important for the rest of the talk, there have been at least three failed attempts to convert Palmyra to a copra plantations in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, and what copra is, if you're not familiar, is the dried meat of coconuts. So a lot of the Pacific around this time, um, there was people uh, making a lot of money converting these islands to copra plantations, but Palmyra was too remote um, and they were never able to actually make that, um, they're never able to actually make it work. So Palmyra Atoll nowadays, it's this multi-agency collaboration and it is um, also ran with the Nature Conservancy. So it is a private nature preserve owned by the Nature Conservancy within a wildlife refuge uh, managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service within a marine national monument, which is co-managed by the Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA. So we often jokingly call it the Turduncan of conservation uh, because we've got these multiple layers of protection around this uh, very special atoll. This is a relatively recent map. So um, this island here and outlined in black, this is called Cooper Island. This is the island that the Nature Conservancy actually still owns. This is the island that the runway is on. And they also have a just phenomenal uh, research station down there. So that is where we live when we're down there for our seasons um, working. And it has you know, um, solar power as well as a backup generator. And we run on rainwater, it's totally off grid. Um, and it is the, actually the nicest research station I have ever had the pleasure to work in. Um, it's very, very, very nice. All right, so back to this coconut control project. So in one sentence, the goal of this project is to clear about 2 million coconuts, both sprouts and adults, and reforest with native plants. And now I know this sounds strange at first, but remember what I told you about there being at least three failed attempts to convert Palmyra to a copra plantation? So basically there was large swaths of the atoll that were just clear cut of native species and planted with coconut monocultures. And these coconuts are now, uh, they've become invasive and they're crowding out other species of atoll specialists. So this photo here you can see over on this side is one of the plots that um, we cleared the understory of. And you can see the border where we stopped clearing. This is what a lot of the atoll looks, not all of it, but a large portion of the atoll looks like right now. To move through the understory, you are literally swimming through coconut <laughs> sprouts. Either that or you have to machete your way through. So um, it has actually just become a complete monoculture for large portions of the atoll. So um, the second part of that project is we're reforesting with native atoll species. And there's actually two species that we're focusing on. Um, one is Pisonia grandis and the other is these heliotrope trees. And both of them are preferential um, nesting material for seabirds. Um, and you can actually see in this photo here, if you look closely, there's this hollow in the tree and you can see one single tail feather sticking out. Uh, when I went to check out the tail feather, there was a beautiful white-tailed tropic bird nesting in there. Um, she gave herself away with her, her long, <laughs> beautiful tail feather. 
Um, so most of toll specialists, because this ecosystem is not as well studied as many others, a lot of species are considered data deficient, which means we don't even actually have a good handle on if they're, um, you know, we don't have enough data to classify them as endangered. But it is thought, you know, that the atolls globally are, they're doing poorly. So um, that is mostly due to uh, climate change and sea level rise, but there's a lot of other issues, you know, with the legacy of exploitation on these islands and, and that sort of thing as well. Um, and, and this photo here, this is the canopy of that Pisonia grandis tree. So in a, in a healthy forest, um, they are the, the canopy species um, and the seabirds love them. And so this is something I haven't really uh, quite emphasized enough. Palmyra is a seabird colony. So um, what we, <laughs> let me just show you like a little 10 second clip of the city near the city turn colony so you can get an idea of uh, the density of seabirds on these islands. Yeah, so most of these seabirds, they nest on the ground. Um, and we have a joke on Palmyra that you never, ever, ever look up with your mouth open <laughs> because you are living beneath just a, like a, a swarm of seabirds a lot of the time. So to summarize the motivation for this project, many of the islands in the atoll have become a coconut palm monoculture. Palmyra is a seabird colony. And we have a lot of data that shows that seabirds prefer to nest in islands that have native forest. There's very little nesting in the coconut monoculture islands. They just don't like them. Um, additionally, Palmyra may be an example for how other Pacific islands can reforest native plants. So um, a lot of Pacific islands have had the, these copra plantation conversions and that are no longer operating as copra plantations in most cases. And so this is uh, a way, what, you know, what we're doing is a low impact and low cost way to convert some of these forests back. So a lot of different Pacific Islands are watching us to see how, how this goes and how it turns out. Um, and just quickly, these are, these are some seabird photos um, from Palmyra. This is a baby frigate bird. Um, this is one of those city turns protecting its egg. Um, this is a pair of mass boobies with a little chick. Um, and I, I do not have words for how cute these seabirds are and how much personality they have and just how absolutely delightful it is to live and work on a seabird colony. Um, yeah, I, I have a marine background, so I didn't even particularly have much of an interest in birds before I started working on Palmyra, and that very quickly changed. So something that is really important to know to understand the larger motivation of the project is the connection between seabird colonies and coral reefs and atoll ecosystems. So seabirds are these incredible species. Um, there's, there's many species of seabirds, but they all do these really impressive foraging flights. So what that means is while they may uh, nest and sort of like hang out on these atolls, they can fly, um, some, there's some species that have been shown to fly over 500 miles a day at sustained speeds of 50 miles per hour in the case of some species like albatross. Um, and they go out on these long foraging flights where they look for food and what they're looking for is fish. So atolls have very low nutrients generally. Um, and when the seabirds go out to sea and they get fish and then they come back and then they poop on the atoll and that, that fertilizes the atoll. So uh, seabird guano is very nutrient rich and uh, um, highly, you know, it's actually been sought after by, you know, people in, the 18 and 1900s who used it for energy sources. And this guano fertilizes the atoll and as well as the reefs when it rains. So the, the, the guano gets washed off into the reef and you have this really awesome feedback loop where you have the seabirds uh, supporting the reefs and then the reefs supporting the seabirds. Um, Cause a lot of those reefs are, uh, you know, nursery habitat for the fish that they they that, that then grow up to be the, some of the species that they're eating. So they have this really tight cycle where they're um, supporting each other. 
Um, this is a study that, that was actually not done on Palmyra. This is from um, some, an archipelago, the Fiji archipelago. But I really love this photo because it really drives home that uh, relationship between the reefs and the birds. So in this study, they took some um, staghorn coral from the same source and they, they outplanted them on two different islands. One island had a healthy seabird colony, one island did not. So can you guess which island had the healthy seabird colony? Yeah, if you guess this one, you're right. So this is one year later, this is growth from one year from tiny fragments. And I just, I really love this study because these photos really um, summarize in a nice succinct way the, the impact that the having a healthy seabird colony has on the reefs. Um, and I do really wanna emphasize Palmyra's reefs are special. So they have been designated a hope spot by Dr. Sylvia Earle, and they're widely considered a living laboratory. And the reason for this is because, you know, if you've been paying even marginal attention to conservation news over the past few decades, you know, re coral reefs are doing really poorly globally. And for some reason, the coral reefs in Palmyra are doing great. <laughs> and we have had these massive bleaching events, similar to the ones you see in the Great Barrier Reef. But for some reason, the reefs on Palmyra always recover. And we have very little actual death, even during these massive bleaching events, you know, during um, these high uh, sur uh, sea surface temperature events. They, they recover, they bleach, and then they recover. So there is a ton of interest in the conservation community on what's going on with the reefs in Palmyra. Um, and, you know, I don't actually have a lot of time to, I don't really have time to talk about it. There's a lot of reasons why these reefs are doing so great. One of the big ones is that we have an intact trophic system. So it, the, the reefs are not overfished. So we have a predator dominated uh, trophic system, which means we have a lot of sharks. Uh, and when I say we have a lot of sharks, I mean, we see them every day. So every time you get in the water, even when you're not in the water, they're just cruising on by in front of the research station. Um, they're just patrolling the reef, keeping it healthy, keeping it happy, um, and supporting some of the most resilient reefs on the planet. All right, so just to sort of draw everything together. So we've been talking about the Coconut Control Project. This is all part of this larger um, sort of three-step um, project called the Palmyra Atoll Rainforest Realignment and Reef Resiliency Project, or PARP for short, because who doesn't love a good acronym? So there's three sort of larger projects under PARP. The first one was to eradicate the rats, which was done in 2011. This was well before my time with Fish and Wildlife. The second part of this project, which we are currently doing is this coconut control project where we're controlling the monocultures. And then the third part of this project is um, a lot of different reef resiliency work, which is both ongoing as well as future work. Um, and we won't really have time to talk about that today. And I do want to emphasize that PARP is a collaboration. So we have the Nature Conservancy as well as Island Conservation. Both of these are um, nonprofit organizations that do incredible work. And we partner with them at the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and they, so all three of these agencies are providing funding, providing manpower, providing leadership. Um, and this is the trio that did the successful rat eradication in 2011. So there's a, a track record of these three organizations doing really incredible work. So uh, after the rat eradication in 2011, it, you know, those rats that were on the atoll um, were completely dominating the ecosystem functions on Palmyra. Uh, in 28 days, they got rid of all of the rats on the atoll. There was a lot of different changes that happened once the rats were gone. So one of the, the most fun changes is that there was two new species present found on Palmyra. Uh, two new species of crabs found on Palmyra that they did not know were there before. Um, this is kind of, I've only known Palmyra in the post rat eradication days. So this is a little mind blowing for me because there are so many of both of these species present on Palmyra now. It's, it's just bananas to me that there was ever a time when 
we didn't know they were there because the rats kept their numbers so low. Um, that's Geographus grayi, as well as the, the smooth-headed ghost crab. Both of these um, are in extremely high abundances now. But importantly to the coconut control project, once the rats were removed, there was a massive impact on the uh, recruitment of native plants on the atoll. So this project was led by Coral Wolf, who um, is one of the scientists for island conservation. And what they did is they had a, a bunch of different plots throughout the atoll where they went to the plots and they counted the number of little baby seedlings in each of the plots and they did this through time. So here's the results for four different native species. This is four different tree species. This is the number of um, seedlings per plot on this axis and then this is time uh, on the x-axis and so you can see here in 2004 before the rats were eradicated there was essentially zero or almost zero native seedlings in any of these plots the rats were you know such intense um, seed scavengers that they just didn't have a chance but very quickly after the eradication you see these numbers just increasing dramatically Unfortunately, this, you know, this happened, this is great news for the native species, but unfortunately this also happened with the non-native species. So here's a plot for Cocos nucifera, which is um, the coconut palm. And you can see in 2007 in each of these plots, there was low numbers of coconut palms uh, sprouting. These numbers by 2016 were just, you know, much, much higher. And this is how we ended up in that situation where we have this basically unpassable understory. So even though the rats were decimating the atoll in many regards, they were providing this ecosystem service where they were keeping the coconuts in check. So once they were removed, there was nothing there. So how are we controlling these, these coconuts now? What are we doing with the, this understory? Um, we have, over the past few years, developed a three-step process. Um, this is a very sweaty selfie <laughs> uh, taken after doing some of this coconut work. Um, it, is, it is hard. Um, so the first thing we do, we, we divided the atoll into a bunch of different plots and we are tackling this plot by plot. So we, we go into the plot and we clear the understory using a machete and we're operating in small teams. So anywhere from four to 11 people on a team go down there for four months at a time and you are just literally hand clearing with a machete, just machete pile, machete pile, six days a week. <laughs> um, and you clear that understory. Once you've cleared that understory, you can now walk around. You can see in this photo, you, I, you can walk around now, we've cleared it. So now, now we have to treat the adults. So with the adults, you take a drill, like literally a drill you probably have at home, just a wireless hand drill. You drill holes into the adult trunks and then you inject herbicide into the trunks. Um, now at that point, the trees start, they start slowly dying over the next six months. And once those trees have been injected, that plot is considered closed because those trees are dropping um, nuts and fronds so much that it's actually super dangerous to be underneath them. So they're closed for about six months. Um, after six months, we, you know, go do an overhead hazard assessment, and then if it's clear, you can go under there, and then you do what's called a second sweep. And the second sweep is the same as the first, where we're macheting, but instead of just using the machete, we're also using, we have like a little squirt bottle in our other hand that has dilute herbicide in it. And for every coconut that we machete down, we do a little bit of a spray of this dilute herbicide. And what we found is in that first process where we just machete, we have about an 80% efficacy. So about 80% of the coconuts do not re-sprout, but 20% of them do. When we go in with that second sweep and we use the dilute herbicide, about 99% of them 
no longer resprout. So this is the method that we've really dialed in over the past few years where it allows us to move quickly to clear things and also um, have a high efficacy so we don't have to do endless sweeps, but also reduces the amount of herbicide that we're using in the project because we really want to keep the amount of herbicide as low as possible. Um, but it really would just not be possible to do without some herbicide usage. So this is a photo, this is the last crew, the mini cocoa crew that was down there. Um, and this, they're, they're showing all the personal protective equipment we're using. We, uh, we look really cool, obviously. Um, so you're running around with these bicycle helmets on to protect from overhead hazards. Um, you're wearing long sleeves and long pants, which are often sometimes these, uh, these jumpsuits that we're using out in the refuge. Um, you can see how sweaty everybody is. There's little dry patches a couple of them left on people. And then we're also wearing these like lumberjack shin guards are meant to be used for splitting wood. Um, because what we quickly, quickly found the first time we tried to do this is when you are macheteing all day, every day, it does not matter how good with a machete you are or uh, how careful you are, you will massacre your shins. Uh, so we got these shin guards and I am so grateful they're there because uh, I would have probably not have feet at this point if we if we didn't. Yeah, and I do I do want to emphasize this is hard work. I want to be really transparent about that because later I'm going to tell you how you too can come be on the coconut crew. Um, it's hard work. So we we do this in about 30 to 45 minute intervals with mandatory 15 minute rests. And the reason we do this is because in the first crew, and I was as guilty of this as anybody else, um, when we just said, okay, go clear and take breaks as you need, nobody wanted to be the weak link. So nobody was taking breaks and they were just working until they either threw up or were having signs of heat exhaustion um, because we're working in this really intense tropical um, environment wearing really heavy PPE. So what the solution finally was is, okay, I don't care how tough you are. We're working for 45 minutes and then we're all taking a 15 minute break and people will still sometimes pretend like, oh, I don't want to take a break, but you know, we just, we just make everybody take it. Um, and you can see everyone will just immediately strip down to try to cool off and just chug water and we sit and rest and just try to get your heart rate down. And then um, after that 15 minutes, we all go and do 45 minutes as fast as you can again. Um, and this really, really, um, I think we've really dialed in the, the safety with the heat aspect in these working in these intervals. Um, the other thing that's hard that a lot of people don't think about is you're signing up to spend four months at a time on the atoll with the same small group of people and there's no getting off um, and there's no getting away. Uh, you're working and living together. So the small group dynamics can sometimes be challenging, um, but you know, generally speaking, you come out of this with uh, some of the closest friendships you'll, you'll ever have. Um, and if you are you know, somebody who likes to work hard and you know, has a good attitude and can get along with a lot of different kinds of people, it can really be some of the most rewarding work of your life. Um, and, you know, one of the most fun experiences of your life. So after all that hard work of clearing, um, the, the fun part, the really feel good part is the reforestation step. So we do have this really um, nice shade house that we've set up down there where we're uh, propagating uh, rare native plants. And then when they get big enough, we can go out plant them in these plots after they uh, have been totally cleared, like all three steps. A really nice surprise that we got, and uh, we um, did not expect, Palmyra herself has been helping us with the reforestation efforts way more than we could have ever imagined. So a lot of these plots, when we've gone in to reforest, there's not even any room left to plant uh, more native plants because the native seedlings have come up in such high densities um, as soon as we open the understory. So there's going um, to be less effort needed on the reforestation end than we initially thought, which was a really lovely surprise. 
Um, another nice surprise we got is that Pisonia grandis tree, one of the two main species that we are focusing on. So typically Pisonia, the way it reproduces is it'll drop a limb, like a branch, and that branch will grow into a new tree. So Pisonia basically uh, clones itself. And when we have been reforesting Pisonia, we're often doing it from cutting. So we're taking cutting branches off and planting them elsewhere. Of course, that means there's low genetic diversity in our Pisonia trees when we're doing that. And there's not that many Pisonia trees left on Palmyra. So that's not great news, but um, every now and then, so every say five to 20 years, you get these massing events where you have all of these um, environmental factors that come together and all the Pisonia trees will just bloom into these flowers all at once. And we had a massing event when I was down there on 2020 and it was such a delight to discover this. I had never seen a Pisonia flower before and I you know, I was like walking through the forest, like something smells wonderful. And I, I realized that all these trees were in bloom and they form these, um, these sticky trees, or sorry, these sticky seeds. And this is great news because this is going to increase the genetic diversity of our Pisonia on the island a lot. Um, and the way these seeds disperse, they're very sticky and um, they tend to stick to seabirds. And they can actually stick to seabirds to the point that uh, they kill the seabirds. So um, their Pisonia has, will sometimes be referred to as a carnivorous plant, even though it's not technically, um, but it certainly creates its own fertilizer um, by sticking to seabirds. All right, so this project, uh, like literally everything else on the planet was very much impacted by the pandemic. So in the end of 2019 into early 2020, uh, I was down on Palmyra, as was my husband. Uh, this is a photo of him, mostly just to embarrass him uh, with the biggest coconut crab we've ever seen. Um, and we were down there and we came off of Palmyra on, in February of 2020. We were off for about two weeks before the pandemic was declared. Um, and, you know, we were replaced with another cocoa crew and that cocoa crew did decide that they wanted to stay and finish their season. So we did have a crew down there until, um, June of 2020, but then after that crew was removed, uh, the sort of all the agencies involved basically decided it was too risky to put a new crew down there and we needed to go down to just a skeleton crew. So remember at this point, we didn't have vaccinations. We didn't have uh, rapid testing. All we could do was quarantine before we went down and hope for the best. Um, and so I went down again in late 2020 as a, a, a cocoa crew of one <laughs> um, and you know made very slow progress, but just to try to keep the project moving forward and you know just to have a fish and wildlife presence on the atoll. Um, it was really challenging that season because there was only six people on the atoll. Um, and we were still being, we were being asked, even though we had quarantined two weeks before we went down there and then quarantined an additional two weeks once we arrived, um, we were still being asked to mask and socially distance from each other the whole time we were down there. Because there is no medical care on Palmyra and evacuating people is expensive and, you know, it's like a multi-agency effort where we have to get the Coast Guard involved. Um, so, and in theory, you could be asymptomatically passing it around between each other. So we just, we just had these, um, you know, really a very isolating season down on Palmyra. Um, but in some ways it was also really fun to just be running around the island, you know, by myself on my little fish and wildlife boat. So, uh, it was definitely, definitely an experience. Uh, so since then, we've had one, we've had um, some small cocoa crews down there, um, and um, especially now with vaccinations and rapid testings, you know, the, the situation is very different. We um, aren't having the same very strict social distancing rules and that kind of thing. So it is, it is uh, easier to be down there again. Um, and this is our most recent project, or our most recent progress with the um, cocoa control effort. So uh, remember I said we had divided the 
that's all into a bunch of different plots. So I think it, I think it's 147 plots and we're tackling them plot by plot. So the pink are ones that have been cleared and are considered done. There's no reforestation efforts needed. So these are the plots that um, just had enough native recruitment. We didn't have to do anything after we cleared the coconut. Uh, the blue plots are ones that we did the three steps of clearing um, and then we've also reforested and they are considered done. The orange are the ones where we've had the first, um, oh, I'm sorry, the green are the ones that we've had the first sweeps completed. So the first sweeps are the most time intensive and um, effort intensive because it's so dense in that understory for the first sweeps. So uh, that's what all these green plots are. And then the orange ones are ones that ha we haven't done anything on them yet. So we've actually, in terms of acreage, we've cleared half the atoll. We've gone in by hand with machetes and volunteers and cleared half the atoll. Uh, we have not cleared half of the coconuts yet. And the reason for that is because these plots down here, which we haven't really gotten to, have extremely high density of coconuts. So those sort of, um, even though half of the acreage has been cleared, we haven't quite gotten to half of the coconuts. Um, but considering what, you know, we've all been facing the past two plus years now, um, I think, you know, everyone's really proud of the progress we've made. All right, and so if I didn't, you know, scare people away too much, I, I will give a little plug that we are, now hiring for the next COCO crew. Um, so if you're interested, uh, the easiest way to find the job posting is if you look at the Texas A&M Fisheries and Wildlife Job Board and you type in Pal Palmyra, it will bring it up. Um, I will say you don't have to have a science background. Some of our actual um, you know, most successful volunteers have not had science backgrounds. Um, the main requirements are that uh, you know, working hard is something you enjoy doing, um, that you have an interest in conservation and that you know, you're a, a laid back person who can get along with a lot of different kinds of people. Uh, if you, those are the three main requirements. Everything else can be trained. Um, and we're really, it's more, it's more like trail work or like trail crew work than it is true um, science work for these coconut crews. So um, yeah, and, we, and also you don't have to be like a, you know, you do need to be relatively fit, but we have had all sorts of different kinds of people, um, all different ages, and, and there are a lot of different people have been successful on these crews. So um, if you're interested, I would encourage you to, to look into it. So uh, my last real thing I wanted to say is Terry had asked me to just talk uh, briefly about my pathway to science. And I think that's really because I come from a non-traditional background. So uh, I am the first person in my family to graduate college. Um, I'm actually the first woman in my family to graduate high school. Um, and I did not have you know, any financial support whatsoever for my education. Um, and I, it's really important to me that I, you know, like just, I hate how hard it is to get educated in this country, but it is possible. And something that I really want to say to people is if you are interested in STEM at all, any STEM, you do not have to pay for your advanced degrees. So when I was an undergrad and my TA told me that this blew my mind and this changed my life, I did not pay for my master's or my PhD. They will pay you to do that. There is a lot of funded positions. So when I was doing my PhD, I was getting paid $25,000 a year to do my PhD. And then if I wanted more money, I could teach some undergraduate courses and get paid on top of that. So I did not go into debt to get my, my advanced degrees, even though I didn't have support from my family. And if you are in a STEM field, these funded positions are very common. They're competitive. You have to do well as an undergraduate. You can't you know, graduate with straight C's and get them, but it is very possible. And it, you know, I felt financially secure through my graduate programs, um, you know, even without the sort of safety net of financial support from my family. And if you have questions about this, I have 
spoken to many first gen college students um, about how to do this, uh, you know, how to apply to grad school, how to get these funded positions. Um, there's my email, email me, we can have a Zoom chat, I can walk you through it. Um, don't let that be a barrier to stopping you from advanced degree. Um, there's less opportunity for that for your undergrad. I was lucky enough, I got an academic scholarship out of high school, um, but yeah, I, you know, if you if you don't have that, it's, it's harder for your bachelor's. But once you get past that, there's a lot of options available for you. So I'm very serious. If you want to talk about this, please email me. We can absolutely Zoom about how to apply to this because uh, I had a TA during my undergraduate years really hold my hand through this process and she changed my life. So I will pay it forward. So that's really it for my talk. I'm gonna leave you with this little video of um, a lot of very excited hermit crabs. <laughs> we have an area outside of the research station we call Crab Town. Um, and that's where we dump any food that um, wasn't used. The crabs love it. Um, and they, yeah, they come in very high numbers to eat our scraps. <laughs> and that's really, that's it for me. Do you, do we have any questions? Hi, sorry, it's Susan here. Um, and there are some questions that have been popping up in the YouTube chat, so let me fire away. Uh, Linda Brzezinski has a few, uh, but she starts off with, are all the coconut trees going to be killed or are you going to leave some? Excellent question. That's an excellent question. So uh, we are not going to kill all of the coconut trees. So in a healthy atoll ecosystem, you have coconut palms basically along the beach um, and you and you know maybe a couple more inland but you have a different assemblage of plants sort of inland on the atoll so um, when we have a healthy atoll you know forest system inland they can hold their own against you know the coconuts on the shoreline um, yeah we are not killing all of them i think the goal is 95 percent control and then at that point, um, you know, the rest, and we're, you know, we, we're already seeing it's working. So we don't need to get 100% control. It wouldn't even work because coconuts flow amazingly and there's other atolls or some would end up washing up, right? Um, and that, at that level, it is part of the healthy native ecosystem. What we just don't want are these totally dense monocultures for the whole island. Okay, sounds good. Um, another question, how many people live at the research station at any one time? And then is anyone else living on the atoll? So it is just the research station, but and on any given time you can have, so with the skeleton crew, it was six of us. Um, I've heard of it being as little as three. Um, and I've been down there with as many as 40, but max capacity, I think is 28. So, um, you know, the time we had more than that, there was more than there was supposed to be there. And it, it did start to feel crowded. Um, and we're down there, there's somewhere around four people working for the Nature Conservancy at any given time who are just there to keep the station running. Um, and if you have skills in like being a maintenance person or cooking, either of those, you can get a decently paid job down there for a season on Palmyra. Um, or if you have like a captain's license, there, there's often a CMO, um, chief of marine operations down there as well. Um, and then uh, there's fish and wildlife, anywhere from one to, you know, 12 of us. And then there's a ton of researchers from different universities that come through um, all the time. So some of our regulars come from um, UC Santa Barbara, UC San Diego, Scripps, um, Stanford, those, those are the main four that are down there all the time. Um, and yeah, they sort of come down for like two or three weeks, whereas Fish and Wildlife and Nature Conservancy employees, you're signing up for about four, four to six months. Okay, thanks. Um, Anthony Gibson asks, does the herbicide that you put in the adult trees have any negative effects on the surrounding organisms? Yeah, so we have done a lot of work on choosing sort of the lowest impact herbicide and minimizing 
um, the amount that we're using. And we are, as we go, like taking samples in the water and in the soil um, and testing to see how long that herbicide residuals last in the ecosystem. Um, and because we're using so little over a large area, we're finding that the residual herbicide is gone very, very quickly. Like we can't detect it at all, like two or three months later. Um, and we, we chose a, a special formulation that was um, not going to be persistent in the soils. So um, as far as we can tell, we're not, and especially considering how much recruitment we're seeing in those same plots just a few months after we've treated, I would say the impacts are negligible. Okay, good to know. Um, so I have another question. Overall, have you experienced more or less support for this and similar past projects throughout the years like volunteers, donations, um, just to comment, people seem to care a lot, at least online. Are you seeing that in action? Mm. You know, I will say that in, you know, the first coconut crew that we hired, um, we had a kind of a small applicant pool, whereas the most recent one, we had a giant applicant pool, like hundreds of people applied. So I do think as word is getting out about the project, um, you know, we are getting more people interested in going. Um, we also, you know, I'm not involved in the fundraising for the Nature Conservancy, but um, I do know that that station is expensive to run and they operate exclusively off of donations. So, um, you know, I'm not privy to those details, but I, I think it's, I think they're doing fine. <laughs> um, but they also, of course, are accepting donations if there's anybody who feels like they have, they can <laughs> uh, get into contact with them. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, another uh, biology type question. How does the masting event increase genetic diversity? If all of the plants are clones of each other, aren't they just share, sharing the same genes? Right. So what you end up, I mean, Pollination um, is, you know, basically it's plant sex, right? So when you when you have pollination, you get genes uh, combining in novel ways. So even though you have um, different, you have like maybe there's not as much um, diversity a toll wide as is ideal. You can still take some of those genes and recombine them in novel ways and then have um, individuals that have different combinations of those genes. Um, so those different combinations, you know, if you have, you know, and we have had issues, we had a massive die off of Pisonia, um, I think in, I think it was in 2015. Um, due in part to an insect infestation, but it was also climatic because there was a global Pisonia die-off at that time. Um, but when you have new combinations of genes present, then that's more likely that some of them will make it in those stressing events instead of just identical clones. Um, you know, there's probably... I mean, I'm just guessing, but there's probably a hundred really strong, at least a hundred really strong, healthy Pisonias on the atoll. So that's a lot of different sets of genes that can be combined in new ways um, and result in, um, yeah, not, you know, new combinations. Okay, good. So are the coconuts any good? Oh, they are so good. <laughs> They're so good. <laughs> <laughs> they are so good. And yeah, we do. Um, yeah, while you're working, you know, you don't want to do this under the trees that have been treated with uh, herbicide. But um, when we're still doing the first sweeps, we take them and hack off the end and drink them in your little 15 minute breaks. Um, and yeah, we, there's a husking station near the station. And like, <laughs> it's like the joke if somebody's getting grumpy you just give them a coconut and say go to the husking station because <laughs> you know you can take off your aggression husking the coconuts and then they come back with you know 20 coconuts that are husked and ready to go and then they're a hero and everybody wants some of their coconut you know <laughs> um yeah they're wonderful so coconut water is supposed to be rehydrating do you use those when you take your breaks yeah absolutely absolutely very good and it's really nice iced too. Sometimes we'll, you know, ice them in the fridge and then it's cold. It's oh, so good. 
think you're going to get more applicants now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on the on the darker side, well, you know, however you want to look at it, I have a question. What's the worst weather that you've experienced out there? Yeah. So uh, during the rainy season, I mean, I have been very lucky. I've been down there for rainy seasons and had mild ones, but I've heard stories where it's just pouring for weeks on end. Um, and that's, you know, you still, it's, it's still, you still have to go work in it because it's, uh, it's expensive to be down there. Uh, so you're just out working in a downpour day in, day out. And, um, I have not experienced that, but, um, I've heard from people who have the morale gets quite low. Um, <laughs> usually what we see down there is you get these tropical storms that just roll through, um, and they're, they can be extremely intense, like the most intense rain of your life, but then it's gone in 20 minutes. Um, and that is more typical for what's, what happens down there. Um, on the flip side, if you do get a drought and I've been down there during a drought as well, then everybody is really, really rationing water because you're running on rainwater. Um, so I have been down there. We, we luckily got a rainstorm before it got to this point, but we had a meeting where we had decided we couldn't use the showers anymore. We were gonna have to start showering in the lagoon. <laughs> um, but luckily before we had to mandate that, uh, we got a good rainstorm. Um, thank God, I hate showering in salt water. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Um, another question, what happens to the coconut vegetation you clear? It Does it biodegrade? It does, and the crabs love it. So very often um, when I've gone in after the first sweeps, the little stumps where you've cut and then, you know, the stacks of the palms are just covered in the land crabs. We have like 10 species of land crabs on Palmyra and some of the highest densities anywhere because they're protected. You know, land crabs are supposed, supposedly delicious. So um, anywhere there's human habitation and there's land crabs, their, their numbers are kept low by people eating them. They're also extremely easy to catch. So <laughs> that doesn't help their case either. Um, but yeah, the, the crabs do a lot of that work. And then, you know, nutrient cycling is just so fast on the atoll. It's one of the reasons why it's so satisfying to work on them. Any sort of management that you do, you see the impacts of almost immediately. So things degrade quickly, things grow quickly, um, things change extremely rapidly. Um, yeah, so you've got, you've got lots of things going on. They, do, they break down very, very quickly. And occasionally, um, we've had a couple of cooks who like to use the palm uh, fronds in various salads. They've made some amazing salads. So we occasionally have brought back some, um, some palms for, for salads. <laughs> That's great. Yes, yeah, some of the field studies trips I've been on, you know, the food is like the thing that draws you there because you have, you know, you work really, really hard, but you have great food. So it sounds like you guys have that. <laughs> yeah, we do. Man, I, I, you, we eat well on Palmyra. Yeah. All right. So that has uh, exhausted the questions in the, in the chat right now. I uh, just wanted to toss it to Terry Curtis again and see if she caught anything that I missed or has any other wrap ups, but thanks from my end. No, Susan, I think you got caught all the questions. There were some great questions. Um, but I am seeing lots of comments that say that the talk was really interesting, that it was a great talk, and thank you. So I think that's a good way to end. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone, for listening. I appreciate the invitation and the attention. And um, yeah, spread the word if you know any people who at a point in their life where they can go disappear for four months on a tropical atoll. <laughs> Great right, job, well, Danny. All right, I'd like to thank everyone again. Thank our speaker. Uh, thank all the MAPS committee members who helped. Thank you, uh, Terry Curtis, for recruiting our speaker tonight. And um, thank all of you for attending and for asking questions and spread the word share the, uh, the site with other people you think might like to see this recorded talk. And I hope to see you at the next 